Reclaim is a podcast for women, by women, on conversations that matter, with your host, Thais Skye. Together, we will explore the questions of what does it look like to reclaim our sovereignty, our worthiness, our voices as women in this messy world. No topics are barred as we offer roundtable discussions on life, spirituality, politics, and what it means to be a woman in the modern age. Let's do this. Hello, hello, everybody. Thais Sky here. Welcome to Reclaim the Podcast. I am here with... Are you going to... Lindsay Ray. Are you going to say your name? Maybe. <laughs> uh, we are in Lindsay's closet today. It's been a hot minute since we recorded an episode. Since we've been in the closet together. Yeah, so I thought, let's let's do this. Let's engage in... See. <laughs> I'm just tucking back my dry cleaning plastic, which I hate that they give you plastic oh my gosh. for, but that's a whole mother issue. Are you ready? I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm always ready, even though when I, I feel like I'm not. Okay. Well, we've been talking a lot um, about social justice because this is something that we've been continually uh, peeling the, the layers of, and I think something that I've been thinking a lot lately is what happens when you experience an ideological shift that is of such massive proportions like awakening to spirituality and when you realize that there is this idea of consciousness and that you um you know are like a spiritual being having a human experience that was like the first kind of ideological awakening that i had and then now this past year we've both experienced the ideological awakening of uh, privilege and social justice, and I think um, getting both of these ideological shifts require a new understanding of human suffering mm-hmm. and the human experience. Well, I'm always open to talking about these kind of topics because I think they're the most important, and I think that when you go through any kind of massive shift or new level of awakening, there's a whole internal and external process that comes with that yeah um and in any kind of process there comes a spectrum of emotions absolutely and i think sometimes often a lot of times i think that we try to outrun the emotions of our process you know i mean you kind of had i think your opening to the ideology of you know privilege and whiteness and you know the collective effects um you know a little bit before me yeah and then I kind of followed suit um a few a few months later in uh, yeah and a few months later and really you know I always really appreciated our conversations around it because they were so just open and yes. honest and yeah um and, you know, my personality is definitely one of extremes. I, I I swing from one end of the pendulum. Me too. To the other. And then, like, my process is to yes. find the middle. But finding the middle is really painful for me. I, absolutely. And I think that's where I'm at right now. Yeah, I agree. Where I swung the from one extreme of not knowing anything about spirituality, not understanding anything about um, uh, New Age or religion. or uh, I hated God. I, I was an atheist. I was very angry at God or this idea of God. And I went from kind of that experience to suddenly reading every self-development, self-help, spiritual book I could get my hands on. I started going to yoga every damn day. I went from not even knowing really too much about yoga to doing yoga teacher training within like a four-month mm-hmm. period. Yeah. And in when I went into teacher training, I knew more about yoga than people that had been doing yoga for years and years. Yeah. Because I just, I started a yoga blog. I went full in. You had a yoga blog? I did. That's how I started. What? That is how my entire experience of the online marketing world world started I had a yoga blog well first I started a blog when I was in London when I lived in London I was studying abroad and my friend had a blog and I was like why do you have a blog and she's like well instead of sending out an email 
to all my family. You just post it up. Telling them where I'm at. I just write on your blog and share that with them. And then they can follow my adventures in, in Europe. And I was like, that's such a brilliant idea. So I started writing a blog, which I still have, by the way, of oh all gosh, of my... so funny. We're learning so much about Thais today. <laughs> All of my adventures in London and Portugal and everywhere and the yoga I went. World and so learning. that was before. That was before yoga. So then, kind of had my awakening, and I was missing blogging. And I remember it was the winter of 2010. I was working for the first time in my life at a full time job. Uh, I had graduated early. Uh, I graduated a year early from college, so all of my friends were still in college celebrating their final senior year, and I, I didn't have that experience, and I was very lonely, and I didn't really have a hobby. So one day, my mom's like, well, why don't you try doing yoga at this studio? And I went. I fell in love. Uh, a month later, I asked about teacher training, and in that month, I started a blog, and it was all about my journey of yoga and binge eating. Wow. And finding healing of binge eating through yoga. So, yeah, I will show you all of my my <laughs> first iterations of my blog. But That's amazing. I bared my soul online, and it was amazing. I had such a community of yogis from Twitter because I was mm. always oh, on yeah, Twitter. Oh, yeah, you were big on the Twitter chain. Oh, chain, it was, this was train. when the Twitter was cool because... I missed that boat. It was, it was about connection and collaboration. And I met so many people from the yoga industry that were also having yoga blogs on Twitter. And it was, it was brilliant. Lindsay, it was a brilliant time in my life. Anyway, so very quickly, I swung my pendulum into yeah. spirituality. And, you know, then I went into health coaching. And I was all into nutrition and healing myself from binge eating by trying to understand nutrition. And, you know, doing some health coaching. And... I wanted to quit my job right there and then and go into health coaching full time, but I didn't have the resources or the capacity to do that, and I was still doing a lot of transitioning. And then I kind of found a middle ground of of the kind of spiritual world, and I was like, okay, this is where I landed. I feel good about where I'm at in the spiritual world. And then a new ideological shift, uh, what, five years, six years later? Mm-hmm of social justice and then it became if you are white you are bad and if you are not open to social justice then you are violent and abusive and a terrible 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 human and how can you be alive in this world without talking about social racial justice Mm -hmm. and now I'm coming back to a I think a more centered place of understanding how I can be operating in the world without making everyone bad mm. uh, while still absolutely committed to having the conversation and awakening people into social justice and the importance of social justice. Yeah. And I think this is important. So let's talk about this idea of self-righteousness because this is what we were talking about earlier. earlier is that when I think you go into an ideological shift or when you are in pain, or when you're in a fight with somebody. Or when you're just opening yourself up to wit- bear witness and have true compassion and experience another people, another person's pain or a collective group of people suffering. It immediately walks you into, I'm right, I'm morally superior. Well, you want to jump right on that soapbox. Yes. You know I love my pedestals. <laughs> I, love, I love pedestals. I love the preaching box. I like really, really low ones. Like <laughs> ones that just give me a few inches. Oh, no, no. The, the taller you I'm can go. I'm wise enough to know that any pedestal or soapbox or anything eventually gets knocked down. And I'm all about like, let me fall like the As least we- amount. <laughs> Because oh, it will maybe yeah. hurt less. No, like. <laughs> I climb I climb an Everest of pedestals <laughs> and self righteousness. <laughs> and then I get knocked the fuck, fuck down. down and my ego hates me. See, I'm hoping just for like a broken wrist, you're looking at like a full body cast. <laughs> Absolutely. This is I'm like, let me minimize my own destruction. <laughs> yeah. So okay, so so let's talk about like an interpersonal experience. Like an yeah. interpersonal let's start there. So when we're in relationship with somebody, because we both have had this experience multiple times. Mm-hmm. When we're in relationship with someone, whether it's a family member, a friend, a partner, a significant other, our dog. No, just kidding. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we're in a in a relationship and we feel hurt 
uh, our general propensity as humans is to go into, I feel justified in my pain and you are the perpetrator of my pain and therefore I am justified, I am righteous, I am allowed to be vindictive and angry at you for causing this pain within me. Mm-hmm. And so we tend to go into this, this space of because I'm self-righteous, because I'm right and you're wrong, you're an other and I'm superior and the only way, and I'm, and I'm being harmed by you mm-hmm. and the only way that, this, that I can go back to trusting you and feeling safe in this relationship is if you admit your wrongness and your badness and submit to my righteousness. Mm. Do you feel like that's that that's accurate? I get I get what you're saying. I'm following it. Um, and then the problem is that removes any nuance or any space for the other person who is probably feeling the exact same way you are from from allowing them to have the space for their feelings. So then what happens is you're both battling out your righteousness while ironically feeling hurt on the exact same way in the exact same level. And so if you don't ever put down your sword, you can't heal. You, neither of you can move forward because both of you feel fully justified and fully defensive. Mm-hmm. And when you're battling each other's defenses, you can't move from that. Well, I think as humans, and this is obviously just my theory, um, what we tend to do is we tend to use emotions to escape other emotions so we were talking about this earlier how for many of us it's more comfortable or maybe acceptable because of like our upbringings or our environment or um you know it's just easier for us to kind of swirl in the anger and use that emotion to bypass the pain. Absolutely. And the sadness. Absolutely. And the grief um, that we're actually really feeling. And, yeah. you know, it's funny because I, I have, um, you know, a lot of friends who, bless them, they're, many of them are just such really um, open and aware and conscious parents and, you know, I have really interesting discussions with them. And, and one friend in particular, she, she goes to a lot of, like, mommy groups, um, but from a very, like, psychotherapeutic kind yeah. of standpoint, which I, which I love, obviously. And she's been taught to parent in a way where when, the, when any of her children uh, start emoting and, um, you know, expressing emotions – as you know say frustration or anger um you know through like tantrums or fits uh she sits with them yes and she allows them to tantrum and she just sits with them and she witnesses it and then she supports them by holding the space to allow them to actually get down to the sadness that yeah. they feel, yeah, and the and the the discomfort of that sadness and the pain of that sadness, because so many of us, we haven't ever had that, no, you know, and it's 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 so. What I find is that my default tends to go into the anger, yeah, um, and stay there because. I can't, someone else isn't, like, the person on the other side, I don't trust that they're willing to sit in the pain with me. It's just so funny that we're talking about something so deep at the same and time. And Chewie is, like, literally climbing Mount Everest of, like, bags in trying to closet. find Trying to find a comfortable space for himself because <laughs> I kicked him off my lap. No, I hear that. I hear that. We We don't know how to be with our emotions. We don't know how to be with our anger, let alone our sadness and our grief and our resentment and frustrations. And so I think that that is why it's so easy for us to to get sucked into the spiritual, uh, immature 
uh, understanding of positive vibes and uh, the, 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 the uh, understanding that, you know, your thoughts attracts things. And so oh, that's you just, just want to be... That's a, like what we perceive as a really shiny, pretty, easy escape strategy. But that's what I'm saying. It works. I mean, yeah. this is why there's well, so many... Well, it works for a certain period of time. Positive, right. It's positive, inevitable. Exactly. It'll come back. Right. And it comes back crashing because when you don't listen, it just... Yeah. You're you're stuffing that stuff inside. I mean, mm-hmm. this is why I binged eight for so long was because I was denying myself feeling all of the feelings that I was feeling and the trauma and all this, the, the childhood stuff. Mm-hmm. And it came out somehow. And that's, that's always what happens. And so even though... Yes, to a certain extent, you know, we want to be, we want to be happy and we want to uh, be conscientious of our thoughts and understand that we do have responsibility for how uh, we act in the world. I have seen and studies have shown that obsessing with positive thinking actually creates more damage than good. Oh, it denies our, our human experience. And at the same time, we've got to know that self-righteousness will never serve us. It will never serve us. In the uh, the way that I'm saying we can allow ourselves to have self-righteousness, this is a a feeling that we have to dig deeper and to understand where it's coming from. But at the core of self-righteousness, you'll always find pain. Mm. And, And not being witnessed, not being seen, not being heard. Yeah, I think what we're seeing... And I think this this dynamic plays out in every aspect of our lives is the my pain is worse than your pain game. Yes. Um, we all do it. And we all do it because our pain is never truly seen, heard, or val- validated from outside other people. Can we talk about the different ways that we invalidate people's pains? Oh, sure. Like, I mean, like uh, if I'm like, hey, Lindsay, you know, I just had a breakup. I'm really devastated. What have you seen that people generally respond to that with? There's so many. So um, one first one that comes to mind is, oh, my gosh, I know. I know how you're feeling because I just went through a breakup six months ago and it was just devastating. And da, 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 da. So that example is of Lindsay making this be about her. And her experience in a way that like in a genuinely well-intentioned way of trying to relate to me and my pain and trying to make me feel like I'm not alone in my pain. But what's really happening is you're now making it be about you and your pain. Well, I'm I'm simply trying to just take your experience away from you. Yeah. Um, Even though it's not a malicious. Yeah. It's not intentionally malicious. Yeah. um, On my part, because I do feel like. We have been taught that that's what empathy looks like. Exactly. I really do think that no. that's what we've we've actually been taught. Like, in order to to show and express empathy to another person, we have to say we have to relate to them yes. somehow. When when really, and it's it's very challenging to do. It's very very hard. I I have to work extremely hard on it. I fuck up left, right, and center all day long. But just simply saying. I cannot imagine what you're feeling right now. Yeah. And I am I'm with here. You. I'm with I'm you. I'm here with you. I yes. see you. Yes. What do you what, what, and what, what do, do you, you need? need from me? Yes. And and how they, can I support you? They might be in so much pain that they don't even know what they need. And so even adding another layer on to that and being like, you may not know what you need from me right now. And how the best way I can support you is. And that's okay too. I just want to let you know that I'm open to hearing from you. If and when you do know. Or if and when I can do something that you really feel like I need. Until then, I will be here bearing witness to your excruciating experience. And I am so, so so here for you and I am so sorry that you're going through this we live in an emotional illiterate culture and so of course we don't know we don't know how to hold each other's grief I mean it when a a woman of color a friend a, a black friend says to me oh my gosh 
this happened to me today because of our racist society. How dare I, as a white woman, say, I know, just the other day oh I God. was blah, 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 blah. It's like, what the fuck are you doing? It, it's terrible, but it's it's unfortunately the template yes, that it is the template. we've been provided. Yes. Um, and so, therefore, that's what then tips us over into that really unhealthy dynamic of my pain's worse than your pain yes because when we try to relate to someone it we get in the pain competition yes and then therefore we're invalidating another human but then because we've shared and we've opened up vulnerably and we now we expect them to be able to exactly we expect them to witness us yes but they can't because we've wounded them again. Right. And so now we've just kind of gotten into the cycle again of each of us not validating, hearing, or seeing our pain truly. So we were both now hurt. Like you are, you know, you could have broken up with your boyfriend in the exact same time, minute, second that I broke up with my boyfriend. And yeah. yet your experience is radically different than mine. Absolutely. Because... It's mine. Exactly. Or and it's you have yours. your experiences, your trauma, your childhood, your personality, your Eunice. And so I can't compare. Again, even though we've had the exact same experience, we could have been in the car together and had 100%. a car accident. Same thing. It still does not mean that I in any way, shape, or form know how it's impacting you. And I feel like that this is just another layer of us accepting our humanness. Yes. You know, oh my gosh. And accepting the fact. This is why we're Biffles. <laughs> accepting the fact that no matter how hard I try, no matter how hard I want and yearn to, you know, feel what you're feeling or to take, take away your it pain. away from yes. you, I can't. Yes. And if we all just, just surrendered to that and said, I don't know. Yeah. I can't. I can't. Well, and so I, I remember having a friend who had a miscarriage. And mm -hmm. I was talking to a third party, a mutual friend. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll call the one who had a miscarriage, Annie. Okay. And I was talking to Kim okay. about Annie's miscarriage. And uh, Kim is not as close to Annie as I am. And Kim said to me, I don't know how, what you could say to her. Like, what do you say to her to make her feel better? And I'm like, what type of question is that? There's nothing you can say that will make her feel better. Because it's not going to be better. Right. But this is the this is the the conversation that we have. How can I make her feel better? Right. How can I how can I make her not be in so much pain? And while that's obviously very well intentioned, it's not our responsibility to take away someone's pain. It's not our responsibility to make someone feel better. If they have a cold, sure, go bring them chicken noodle soup. But if they're experiencing There are things grief, that you can support. To soothe to, the bomb. Yes, and to comfort. But you cannot fix. No. And, and that's, that's, uh, that's, that's our, our society. society. That's, that's our, our so yes. that, I can't even talk. That's our society. We are you a just society the of, of fixers. You just missed the perfect, like, synchronistic <laughs> moment. You just fucked that up. <laughs> Heartbreaking. Like, literally, can we're we a talk, society of fixers. Can we talk about the, the, another way? Another thing. Like, oh, I just went through a breakup. Okay, you say that oh, to okay, me. Okay, you okay, say it to okay, me. Okay. You say it to me. Um, so, you know, Thais, I have a really heavy heart. Um, yeah. You know, I just... I just went through, you know, this really challenging, this is you know, good. breakup. This is really good, Lindsay, because something really good is going to come out of this. Like, you're going to write oh, a book, my and you're going to create a nonprofit, and now you're going to be able to relate to your clients in a deeper way, and you get to use this pain Making to it build, worth something. To make it worth something. Like, make it build like, something better. Like, our pain, our experience, basically, because our pain worth. is our experience, somehow we have to make it for something. Or something. There has to be some end purpose, like, some end goal. Because it's not inherently worthy. Yeah. That's so basically what we're continuing to tell each other. You're, you're not fucking yes. worthy. Neither is your experiences because they were for nothing. Yes. Because if, God damn you, if you don't take this pain. And make it and into make something. And make it into something. And that just, like, it literally actually, like, right here in my stomach it hurts. Oh yeah. Like I have like a, like this little pit in my stomach just as we're talking about it because I think that's you know my I, I my body all of our bodies definitely talk to us but I've been connecting to mine more and more and 
I think this is telling me right now, like, yeah, there's a depth of such sadness and pain that this whole convoluted structure has just placed on us. And yeah. we're all running around, like, not even knowing what to do. It's just really um, painful how our capitalistic structure values output and so if you don't turn this into something that you can use and monetize and and you know extract uh, value into our economy into our you know sisterhoods because there's stipulations it, there's no it. there's no inherent worth in that pain yeah like we're not like as human beings like in the spiritual spiritual context um you know you are born and therefore you are inherently worthy perfect and whole yes and i i do believe that and then we come into this society and this structure that basically tells us that we're you have pieces to prove of shit and you have to prove your worth constantly yeah and we're not worthy unless we have this we do that yeah. we give this you we do that life. We, yeah i mean it's 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 really really hard and it's really rough and i think that if we all take a step back and we just accept that and then we we literally say oh Everyone else is going through the same fucking thing. We've got to be able to put down our fear around our pain and learn how to be with our pain. And I know this is something that you work with with clients. This is something yeah. I work with clients is cultivating that emotional Resiliency, uh, intelligence and strength and understanding. And, yeah. And some ability to just be with, I just did a whole workshop yes. in New York and, about this. I, and be with, with our bodies and understand what this means. But here's the thing that we're trying to drive home is that when someone comes to you in pain, we don't, it is not our role to somehow tell them that they can use this pain to make art, to make something. You know, oh, Adele went through that breakup and she made that album and that album became a best-selling album. So her pain was worth it. Yeah. You know, we want to we want to remove that. We need to just be with the gift that comes with the pain. And that gift is the pain and being with that and learning how to be with that. And I have one more that came into my mind. Mm -hmm. You know, you just gone through a breakup or something shitty happens to you. You know, I know that so many of us in spiritual communities are, we've been taught to say, how do you think you attracted that? Oh my God. If somebody, oh, if I heard somebody say something like that to somebody that was in like opening their pain and sharing their pain, I don't know what I would do. What's, what's the reason? Why do you think that happened? What's the reason behind that? Do people you know? say this? Oh yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, I guess, no, you know what? I guess they do. Like, what's do. the lesson you can learn from this? Oh, my God. Yeah, you're right. Like, why I, do I you guess think I'm... that this happened? To, why did you, you allow this? Yeah. You know, anything that happens to you, it's because you are allowing it. So why do you think that you allowed someone to break up with you? Or why did you allow, you know, this to happen? Um, what's, what's the lesson here? And here's the thing. There may or may not be a lesson. There well, I may... mean, there's like always lessons. This is what fucking life is all about. But, but like, I don't need to be reminded of that but when I'm like just in our pain. Our rational mind wants to add meaning to everything and compartmentalize and box in and, and label mm -hmm, our experiences because then once you can understand it, once you can label it, then boom, that, that's done and you can move on. But the emotion is still there and we're not actually sitting into that or honoring that. And that's, that causes disassociation. And for us to be walking around all traumatized in one of these sumo wrestler suits of, of trying to deny ourselves the experience of our pain. And the thing is, we don't always attract, like, we are not that fucking godlike to, to be manifesting and creating and attracting everything. Sometimes shit just happens. And if something happens to you and it's really shitty, Great. Be with that. Don't try to, don't try to like, you know, extract all this Oh, meaning. this happened for a reason. Oh my God. You're going to be stronger from this, whatever. We don't I mean, know that's that. So, it's really cruel, you it's know? It's really cruel. It's really cruel. And that's, I think, I think that's probably like the sum of this is like when we 
consistently try to take someone else's experience, rip it from them and minimize it, it's cruel. So then what happens, Lindsay, because we've been taught that this is how you navigate pain, of course, we're going to step into self-righteousness and defensiveness and closed offness every time we experience pain and instead make it be about how it's about that other person, you know, and make it and, and point the arrow to them because we don't know how to be with our uncomfortable pain. We don't know mm -hmm. how to be with the a breath of emotions that we have. We don't know what to do with that. So what's the, what's the logical conclusion? We blame it on somebody else. And we may not even on the outside say, I'm blaming you. We may quote unquote take self-responsibility by trying to ask ourselves how I, how I attracted this or whatever. But we're still sitting in a space of that person is the problem. They caused this to me. I'm right. They're wrong. And I need to be justified. And this can, can drive really violent behavior and entire relationships can go down like that in flames <laughs> because of this. And this has happened to both of us. And, you know, I was just sharing with you an experience I had with a friend where, you know, they believed that I was the perpetrator and I believed that I was the perpetrator. And I even said to this person, we're both experiencing the same pain. We're both experiencing the exact same thing. We're both feeling really hurt and invalidated by each other. So can we put down the armor and just witness each other and be there for each other in this pain? So you, they thought you were the perpetrator. And I thought they were. Okay, because you said and oh. I thought I was the perpetrator. Oh. I just want to... Thank you make for make that little distinction because I was like, hang on, this would be very confusing because I know what you, I yeah, thought yeah, yeah. you meant. So to I say. thought that they were the problem. They thought I was the right, problem. Exactly. And that could and both both of us could have been right. Both mm -hmm. of us, and this is what I keep coming back to in my partnership. You know, I've been in a partnership um, for four and a half years, so it's a long time to be in relationship with somebody. And I've learned very very quickly that if I hold on to my righteousness, I will I will lose that person. Because that's going to drive them away. You can either hold on to your righteousness or you can drop that shit and be in each other's vulnerable pain. Mm. And that's it. You know, because the same thing goes for for the other person. If they never drop their righteousness, it's not going to work either. Both partners have to be willing to put that shit down, to say I'm sorry, and to witness each other's pain. Yeah, and I think this is, I think ultimately this is what... We're seeing the process slowly unfold, and this is why in our industry um, we are seeing such a, like, the topic of vulnerability, yeah. you know, come yeah. up, yeah. Um, and th that which is great because it's part of the process, but unfortunately what's happening is we have people that are opening up and being vulnerable, and they're just getting more traumatized because we can't hold space we can't for that. hold we can't hold space for oh my gosh pain. it's so painful if as i'm scrolling through facebook and i see people sharing their pain because you know they they it, there's a there's a power in being real well, what with ourselves yeah. and being real with our communities and sharing hey this is a real struggle for me Absolutely. And, and then, what we're taught is we're taught that if we want to evolve, then we need to open up and we need to be more vulnerable. But there's a piece that's missing, and that's the receiving the receiving end of how do we receive someone else's vulnerability. So I see these comments, Lindsay, that are so yeah, painful because tough. people are trying to fix, give them advice, tell them what to do. And this is something that whenever I'm leading any group programs and, and it's a community experience and people will be posting and sharing vulnerably and I encourage encourage that I make it extremely clear unless you are flat out asking for advice yep. and if you want advice you have to ask for it you have to say in the com in the post I am looking for, for advice. advice if that's not there you do not have the consent to give that person advice and people struggle with that like they do all I've gotten so much do, pushback on that and and they'll even they'll even like convolute it and manipulate yes. their comment to look like it's not giving advice yep. but it is yeah because inevitably that's what they 
wanted to do. They wanted to feel useful. They wanted to feel helpful. And so, can you see how they're, what Lindsay's saying, though? It's all about them. Them. They want to feel comfortable in your pain by giving you advice. Well, because inevitably, pain is pain. Yeah. Pain is painful. Pain is uncomfortable. And so whether it's your own or someone else's, you feel that energy of the emotion of pain. Yeah. And you feel that sadness and you feel that that depth. And it's, you, you know, we have been taught to escape those quote-unquote bad emotions, those bad feelings, those bad sensations, you know, so inevitably that's where we go. We yes. go, like our brain is wired to keep us alive. Yes. It's not wired to keep us happy. So when we feel something that is painful, our brains are like, holy shit, I'm probably unsafe. Yes. I need to get the fuck out of here. Yes. You know, and that's what it means to develop this emotional integrity and resilience and strength and intelligence and just connect more to our emotions and let them be. Well, so it's really fascinating when I'm leading these groups and I make it up, you know, I stare very, state very clearly, you do not give advice unless this advice is explicitly asked for mm-hmm. because this is going to be a consent driven group. Mm-hmm. And then inevitably this always happens. Because they're so wired to do this. So I, there's no blame. There's no judgment. But somebody will write something vulnerably. And then there will be someone that will comment at giving advice. Or they'll send them a DM. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and then I will usually comment and be like, notice notice this. Notice that you. this is actually advice giving. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious where you're coming from. Like, what was so uncomfortable about this person's post? Like, I always make it a teaching mo- moment, you know? Like, mm-hmm. what was so uncomfortable about this person's post that, that you- inspired you yeah. to want to... And what's so fascinating is that people are often so uncomfortable being called out that most, like, nine times out of ten... This is every group that I've led. Nine times out of ten, that first person deletes their comment. Oh. They, 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 they tuck in. They yeah. go into the fight, fight, flee, flees, flees, but, fight, 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 freeze. Fight, fight, they they run. I they think duck. This is a really important thing because this is what makes it so messy, right? Absolutely. Is because we don't have all the answers, and we haven't been. We all have not been taught on how to communicate authentically and effectively yeah our behaviors express themselves in ways where we say one thing where where it doesn't match what we actually want need or desire absolutely so and and that's very difficult for the people on the receiving end also you know to to manage that um where you know, it's it's one of those things where it's like I think about this all the time. I'm like, okay, if if someone that I know personally, and I, I might not be super close with them, we might not be like besties, you know, but I but I know them, and maybe I've had a very vulnerable conversation with them, and oftentimes, you know, in communities, this happens to us because we're coaches. Yes. So there's a community of people that we're we know we're friendly with, and inevitably maybe one or two or a couple people have you know maybe had a session with you at one time or they've gone through your program and therefore there's a relationship there that although you're not best friends there is a depth to human connection there and so when said person you know maybe has a very horrific thing happened to them and like say you find out about it on social media yeah because you don't talk to that person every day i actually struggle with and i i'm thinking about this currently like it doesn't feel it doesn't it's part of it doesn't feel right for me to just fall in line and just comment on the facebook posts yeah um, part of me feels like that's not enough. You know, maybe I should, you know, send an email or write a text or, you know, give them a phone call. But that, yes, I'm trying to navigate what that is. But that, again, is like what part of that is for me? Yeah. 
Absolutely. You know? Well, it's so hard because we want to be seen a certain way. So going back to that example of why usually somebody will delete a post if they're being called out, even the most loving way, when we are when we are being seen in a way that doesn't fit our idealized image of ourselves or our expectations, or yep, then we immediately want to shut Erase down. It. And this is it. why you know they say that public fear, public fear, public speaking is the world's like people's number one fear. They like they prefer to die over public speaking, and. I know why. It's because we are terrified that someone's going to see us in a way that we don't see ourselves mm. and this projection that we have of ourselves. So we have this, again, like that sumo wrestler uh, uh, outfit or, you know, like those like spacesuit self, you know, like like an astronaut. Yeah, I'm like, I'm wondering if we shouldn't be saying sumo wrestler. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. I don't think that's like so. You I know. just imagine like, <laughs> but like I, the, I understand what you're trying to say. I like think those, like a spacesuit yes, might be. You're right because I'm thinking about the Halloween costume of the sumo wrestler, blows and I'm up. pretty positive that that's mad mm. cultural appropriation. Totally. And extremely. I, I've actually personally worn one at a party, so <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I'm like, pretty positive. You know. Okay, so but yes, that was piece. That was not PC. That was. Not not politically correct. I but apologize. We if don't I, get it right all the time. I offend anybody. No one can because yeah. we're human. But, but see, we, we but try. we're not taking it personal, and that's the right. deal. Right. So and you're probably gonna get hate mail. Thanks, Lindsay. <laughs> Thank you. But don't take the hate mail personally. I don't. So anyway, <laughs> so so because we're wearing this this spacesuit, this this image of who we are, when we put ourselves onto the world, and someone calls us out. And we're not being seen in the way that we want to be seen. It's very easy for us to want to hide and for us to, like, recoil. And let's talk about, let's connect us with social justice, right? So often when someone Mm. is called out for having a post that's hurtful or harmful or problematic, I've seen so many times white women uh, will delete the post or will delete the comment. And Mm. all that emotional labor and intellectual labor that people did, most of the times that's you know, women of color are doing gets erased and that can be so hurtful for people and that causes even more harm. Well, and that this is just what happens is they, the person who wrote that, in this case you're saying it's a white woman, they are so uncomfortable that they cannot sit in the pain. That's that exactly they feel what I'm saying. I'm that. looping it back around. Exactly. It's all about not being able to be. It's it's not being able to be with the pain and simultaneously taking it so damn personally. And I feel like when you take something personally, it's because you're not actually feeling the pain. Well, and what this does though, this is a very typical example of how our pain can be violent to other people and perpetuate more pain because if we can't sit in our pain then we do something that's destructive and causes pain to others absolutely hurt people hurt people exactly you know and we say we talk about this stuff all the time um you know but i i wonder i wonder how many people actually sit behind closed doors not on podcasts not on you know social media like and really just talk about it. I mean, like, I really value the friendships that I have because these types of conversations that Thais and I are having right now on this podcast, this is not abnormal have, no, for us. Like, this is, these are, this is just how we communicate yeah. with one another on a daily basis. Yeah. And, like, I'm wondering that if we invite more conversations like this in to our daily life I'm wondering if we can start becoming more comfortable with all of these things that we yes. deemed so uncomfortable so bad so wrong like and I can't tell you how uncomfortable it's been for me to have you know conversations with my white beautiful amazing girlfriends who are lovely and wonderful and are you know perfect and whole about the fact Th- their that... Their presence unchecked is harmful. Exactly. And it's it's so painful for me. Um, it's, I'm sure, very painful for them. But you know what? I've learned to navigate that I'm... It's important. The conversations are worthy and so needed. And so I have to just sit with that pain of the uncomfortableness of it. And and so many beautiful things have happened out of out of that that 
ability that I feel like I've I've learned yeah to cultivate in and my life. It just this is why I don't like that I don't like calling my work shadow work. Even though that's predominantly, I, I love shadow work, but I get I don't well, like because it's calling so, it shadow work because because it's it implies um, a, a duality with the light work and the dark work and some sort of juxtapositioning, and I don't see it that way. I see I know. It, all of it as the work. Well, the problem is, and I think we all relate differently to different words, yeah. and you know, because there is such a lack of like linguistic precision in our and you know that we love culture. linguistic precision. Well, it's something that I've I've been kind of trying to trying to get more real about in Me my too. own life. Not you so know? hard about linguistic precision. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> When I write and I can like undo it and rewrite it and redo it and I can Google it thesaurus and different mm-hmm, words and mm-hmm. I love that. There's an art to that and I love writing. Yeah. But when we're speaking fucking like this, like I was just on a podcast interview and she oh, pulled yeah. she pulled a quote from from what uh-huh. I said and it's a beautiful quote. But, but it was basically like, hi, I wouldn't have said that. Like if I had <laughs> if I had written that, I would have added some nuance to that. Yeah. When you pull just a quote. It, it makes a lot of umbrella statements that I'm not comfortable making. But, yeah. like, I get what I was trying to say there. I don't know. I feel like when we're speaking on a podcast like this, all that precision just goes away. And this is why we need to have, like, 30 million conversations of this. Well, yeah. It's I like mean. we need to write, like, novels and novels or speak novels and novels to kind of get to that precision that we're talking about. But Well, fortunately, I think... From, you know, that's my the nonverbal cues um, that people can pick up from your voice, like your tone. I guess and that's like, true. You know, you can really f- pick up, I think, a lot of emotions from like... I'm just tired of but, the concept of shadow because yeah. I'm trying to step away from duality thinking. I know. It, Feminine, it, masculine, it's good, bad emotions. Hard. It's either good emotions or bad emotions. Why does an emotion have to be good or bad? Why can't an emotion just be? Yeah, an right, emotion, right, and be accepted. I think that's really what it is. It's like, you know, it's not necessarily about like the duality. I think of good or bad. It's the context that we place on that yes. duality of like, okay, one thing can be good and one thing that can be bad. Fine, but we've been taught to run away from the bad, yes. to escape the bad, yes. to not be bad. To you know, we we haven't accepted that like it can just be and that can be okay right and it can be fine and it can be acceptable that you are being bad or acting bad or having a bad emotion or negative or like whatever you know it's just like there's uh, so so i'm saying so so 99.9 percent of the work that i do with my one-on-one clients is removing the judgments that we have of ourselves and how we should be okay well and just so i going love this into work linguistic precision on my end i have some really distinct thoughts around judgment and being able to remove judgment judgment is a human experience yes it is And the work that needs to be done is just learning how to not believe all the judgments that you have. Because judgments are useful in a lot of ways. Judgments can protect you. They can get you out of safety. This is why why I can't do podcasting alone. See? (laughs) Because when I sit in my own closet and try to talk to myself about this stuff... I don't get my my linguistic precision expert over here. <laughs> okay, I am by far no expert. Because this I is am exactly very right. new and I to linguistic precision. Just had uh, just finished a client session where she has a judgment voice that is telling her that her behavior is bad, and I go instead of removing that judgment, instead of like making an enemy of this, why, well, let's name it. Let's mm-hmm. let's create a you know she called it um, a little minion. So I'm like great. Let's, what is the minion's name? You know, what is what is this experience that you're having? Call it a name. What has it done for you? Exactly. Both to help you and to Even hurt the you. judgment has a role, has yeah. a part. And we don't want to be fighting any of it. We want to be coming into a space of being able to hold a container for all of this. And what I've seen to be true in my work, in my own experience of doing this for over 10 years now, is that I feel so much better about myself when I don't fight, resist, or push away any part of my experience. Mm-hmm. 
It's like I, it's like every time, you know, I, I do this work and I swing the pendulum and I go into another ideological shift, it's like I can like add it into my, into my basket, Mm -hmm. you know? And so the, the greatest part of this newest awakening of this past year of social justice and yes I had to go into places of judgment yes I had to go places of righteousness there are many Facebook posts that I wrote that came actually from a lot of anger from two white women and I remember some people oh yeah calling me and mm-hmm. being like I don't like it that is not a good leader that you are coming from a place of anger I had family and friends yeah literally just say to me why are you so angry yeah and I'm like why are you not yeah you know, like and I knew that it's okay that those posts came from anger because yeah. that's where I was the fucking at and it's not permanent and everything changes and now I'm not as angry anymore and my posts can be different and I have room to respond in a different way now. But when I stop making an enemy of myself and start to befriend and tend to all of my wounded places, I can step into such a radical wholeness that looping us all around, Lindsay allows me to not take things so damn personally so that when I'm being called harmful or when I'm being called, you know, any of these things, I don't collapse. It doesn't re-trigger my trauma. Well, it I, doesn't shut me down. Mm-hmm. It'll I, I can open into it. I think what basically kind of like a really deep need that we all have is... We have to start kind of surrendering to what is and we have to start learning how to accept the fact that it does, it has to be and both. Like, you know, there has to be some level of awareness around like you personally and then also an education and awareness around you not taking it fully personally. Yes. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So there's an and both to it. And it's like it's about not allowing yourself to be so pummeled by the taking it personally part where it totally destroys you yes. and then leaves you incapable of any kind of movement or motion towards healing or, you know, um, growth evolution all of that stuff and I think there's a there's a level of just we need to increase our level of ability to just take inventory about where we are and learn how to express where we are and just be you know well here's the deal here's the point here's the bottom line you know the work that we do is not inherently sexy you know, that shadow diving or whatever, it's not guaranteed to make you a million billion dollars. Um, but what I have found to be true also, okay, can we pause? What the fuck are you wearing? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Thais is talking about my socks. She's, like what? She's, this is not a sock. This is like a sock. <laughs> this is a sock because it's, it's only a, the head it's a of the sock. It's sock. It's a so. A so. Or it's a k. Okay, so <laughs> These are my favorite socks. They're not socks, Lindsay. Socks. socks cover your entire feet. This is like a half foot coverage. It's like a quarter foot coverage. It, it, even. There's nothing it you can hold. So I wear it's these just for the toes. I wear these socks all the time, and it's it goes past your a little past your toes, like over almost. Like to the midway through your foot. Yeah, like midway through your foot, and it's a half sock. Yeah, they're like you know, kind of they like keep it toesies. They're well. like tan, and so like whenever I wear like shoes, most of my shoes, like I don't like to see the socks coming out. What from the, the fuck top. is the point of that though? It's great. I, my feet don't sweat. But it. But don't you need? Don't you need no. the heel covered as well in no. order to? No. It count? No. As foot they're protection. Fine. Whatever. You know what? I'm gonna make. I'm gonna make Thais link my socks in the show notes <laughs> so everyone can experience the amazingness oh my God. of the sock. Anyway, what I was trying to say is the subtle work. The subtle work is where it lies. Because what is, if you think about the human experience, which I've been thinking a lot about, like what is the meaning of fucking all this shit? Like what is the meaning of life? Like what is the meaning? Is it really happiness? Is it the pursuit of happiness? Is it the pursuit of um, I think we've been sold that. materialist material goods. Is it really like? Do you really experience freedom, no. like true life freedom, if you have more money? 
Like, do you really yeah. experience? Oh, what were we saying? We were saying that. Oh, oh, here's the quote. I read. I I wrote this down. And I was like, oh my gosh, Lindsay, I have to say this on the podcast. Oh yeah. We said this earlier. Mm-hmm. No amount of money, resources, or privilege can buffer you from the pain of the human experience. Ding, and yet, ding, 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 ding. we pursue the resources and the money and the privilege and the positive thinking well, we, and the manifestation that. because we believe we've that been that is conditioned going to, to believe that this is what's going to bring us X, Y, and Z. And I think that that's why it's so hard as white people to really awaken to social justice is because we can barely grapple our own pain, let alone understand the power dynamics and how we hold so much power over people for a color of skin that we did not even sign up for, quote unquote, like we can't, you know, you can't choose the color of your skin. I mean, maybe on a karmic right, like we probably lesson. did before we came right, in. Right, right, right. But don't I'm remember. saying right now you can't just change your skin. Well, okay, you could, but well, tanning. Anyway, well, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, it's like we when we have such a hard time grappling with our own pain, it's very hard for us to grapple other people's pain or the repercussions of our pain on others. Well, that's, I think that's a very important little tidbit to just like point out and highlight. It's very, very hard to not only, like you said, deal with your own pain, but then also take responsibility for the pain that you have caused others. That is incredibly painful to sit with. Oh, yeah. That's the one thing that we try to escape the most. And that's when we say, I didn't mean that. Yeah. That wasn't my intention. Or this is the best. This is the best. This is something that I have learned uh, firsthand by a a perpetrator, right? I cannot believe that you would think that I would ever ever do that intentionally to you oh my god i feel bad i didn't even do anything i know isn't that horrible it's like the most manipulative yeah 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 yeah. terrible thing to say somebody yeah it's so it's or even the other extreme like like i just said i hurt your feelings right and so you're i'm sitting with your hurt feelings and so then i go oh my god i'm the worst person i am terrible how could i have done that that inner dialogue no the outer dialogue of oh, oh, i suck oh. you know saying it to you oh saying it to you even though i'm the perpetrator and i hurt you now you immediately feel guilt Bad, guilty yeah yeah that i'm feeling all these stuff all yeah. this stuff instead of just saying i'm sorry that sucked yeah yeah. And this sucks now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with the comfort and dump out method? Mm, I don't know. So like it's like imagine like a, a circle, a, like like a, like an onion. And in the middle of the onion is the person that is mo- that is hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's say your husband is in the hospital and he's, um, you know, uh, I don't know, is hurt because he's he had suffering. an accident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the people closest to your husband goes on the innermost circle. So let's uh-huh. say that's like your children and um, and then, like, the next outer circle is probably you. And then the next circle out of that is probably people that are a little further away from him, like his parents. And then his the, cousins. Yeah, yeah. His and then, friends. Mm-hmm, and then the circle is more. is like, yeah. And then and you just keep expanding the circle based yeah. on how the proximity. Somebody that heard the story that doesn't even know them but right. still feels because they're super empathic. So your you know? responsibility is to see where you are in that circle and then to comfort the people that are closest into the middle of the, per- of the circle. So mm. you're responsible for comforting your husband. You're responsible for comforting your children. Um, but then you can dump out, which means you can expect to be Get supported support by from... his family or yeah. your family or his colleagues. But like if a co- if his colleague were to go to you and try to ask you to comfort them, that's irresponsible because you mm-hmm. cannot comfort people that are outer on the outer edges of the circle okay so so comfort in dump out i i totally see all this right and i'm just going to ask a question yeah because i think again this is where the messiness of being human absolutely nothing's black and white in that method is that Still taking other people's experience away from them. Because when you think about it in terms of like, let's, we're saying a husband, right? Yeah. And saying like, maybe I'm the wife. And then they, ha- they you know, his parents are right here. Yeah. How can I say that my pain's worse than the mother who bore him? So maybe the parents would be in the same circle as you. Again, this is very subjective. Right, right. No, yeah. no, I get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm just, I think it's You're interesting right. to circle back Absolutely. to exactly what we were talking about is like, again, this is about us. 
and while I think the strategy behind that is it could be helpful, yeah. right, to yeah, help yeah, yeah. check yourself, yeah. you know, um, I still... So and, and as with anything, so let's like, do like dotted lines when we're drawing the circles. Right, there's always there's always so a like we're per, very, uh, perforation. Because but like for example, I would if if my partner were sick, it's not fair for me to expect him to be able to comfort me. Right, but I could certainly go to you. Mm, yeah, no, so no. So even though you could be affected as well by him, you would probably be able to hold more space for me. And so maybe yeah, and maybe I can see that the way we go about this, Lindsay, is actually asking. So maybe mm-hmm. I would ask his parents, hey, you know, are you in a place that we, that you could support me? And maybe then it's their responsibility and their boundary to say, you know what, actually, I'm very affected by this. Like, yeah. I'm probably not the right person. And I actually think, and I, I maybe this is my fairy tale hoping, um, is that I think that if we work hard enough with the people that are closest to us, there's a potential and a possibility that we could simply just sit in our pain together. Absolutely. And that, that would be enough support because there in that, how validating is that to just sit and not try to steal, not try to play the, my pain's worse game and just simply say, this sucks for both of us, for all of us, for everyone. And this hurts. I just, I think, I think we have a long way to go. Well, we do. To cultivate emotional resiliency and intelligence and containers for ourselves in the world. And I think that this is such and a emotional worthy. emotional acceptance. This is such a worthy endeavor. This excites the fuck out of me, you know. I can't wait to bring the emotions workshop to L.A. I know. I, you know I'll be there. I know. It's going to be so exciting. It's going to be really good. Lindsay um, so good. does workshops on emotions and. Um, I don't know. I want to do a course on emotions at some point. It's just like and good, it, good cause stuff. Because this is this. Do you know that I'm like, when I looked at my astrological chart, like I'm Scorpio rising, Scorpio moon, Scorpio Pluto, and my eighth house, which uh, is where my sun in Gemini mm-hmm. is, is also a Scorpio, like the, the way the the house operates on the sun and the Gemini is very Scorpio-like. Mm. So like, and then when I looked at all of my other signs... I'm like 80% water. Yeah. And then I'm balanced out by a lot of intellect and then a little bit of a little bit of fire, mm. like a tiny bit of fire. Yeah, I have a tiny bit of fire, which I think is interesting because I think for the majority of my life I've acted in such a fiery way, yeah. but that I think was really just trauma response Yeah, and like, you exactly. know. Exactly. And I'm like a lot of water. Yeah. yeah. I'm a lot. And I think that this is this. So I experience everything so fully. That has always been my experience. And I'm always shocked that people well, don't feel as much as I do. Back to what we were talking about before. What have you, what are the, what are the invalidations that you've received by being emotional? Oh, you're so emotional. Yeah. So oh, moody. you know, like, gosh, can't you Unreliable. just calm down? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's such invalidating language. I know. And it's so hurtful to other people. Like, why are you so angry all the time? Why are you so, you know, like, I don't know, like sensitive. Oh, yeah. that's a big one. Yes. You're so sensitive. Yes. You cry all the time. So these are the two things that um, I've been uh, noticing lately that I hate. Like, I hate when people say this to me. I hate when people say, who cares? Mm. I really don't like that. That really triggers because me. Because someone, someone like I'm, somewhere cares probably. I'm caring. Yeah. So when I say I share something with you yeah. and then your response is, who cares? Well, obviously you I do because you brought it <laughs> So you're like literally invalidating So you're me. basically like, mm, you don't matter. Yeah. Like that sucks. And back again to like, this is where that linguistic precision comes in. And it's really hard. There's... What's the podcast that you told me about that I was listening to and you were like, you're going to love this. Um, And it was about, it was one of the episodes was about when your politics don't match your pop culture. Oh, uh, strong opinions loosely. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So I'll show it in the, I'll link it to the show notes, but there's a podcast that I really enjoyed called strong opinions loosely. Yeah. It's really good. And there was a whole, um, they did a whole episode about how like, you know, that is just like our preferences, like sometimes emotionally and politically and 
culturally don't necessarily mat like match like our what's what's like important at the time with cult, pop culture and yes. like what's like fun and amusing and like entertaining and like you know th- that's also part of the human experience and like I don't think Thais and I are ever trying to like take that part of the human experience away where like you always have to be having these like really intense no, conversations. No, we can also play. Like you a can lot play, of play. Well, with when, a with an awareness. Yes. Well, and and I found that the more I can actually be with my uncomfortable it, this is the whole point actually. Yeah. Lens, the whole point of this conversation. We're going to get it right now. Mm-hmm. The more that we can hold on to not hold on, um hold space for our pain mm-hmm. and be with our pain, the more pleasure we experience mm-hmm. and the more love that we experience. Love for ourselves, love for other people. Uh, I showed this in the first episode of this podcast. The more that I understood racial social justice and my own harm, my my own uh, the way I the ways in which I harm people unintentionally through my presence and my power dynamics and my privilege. Actually, the more I fell in love with humans, yeah. the more I fell in love with the dignity of humankind. The more I was able to add nuance to my language to make sure that my spirituality was not coming from a place of privilege. I was not unintentionally saying these things like you, your pain, you attracted your pain. You know, the more that I can really understand how that's actually really hurtful and violent to people and and pull back and, and add more nuance and speak only of my experience, right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the more I was able to really love the potency of the human experience. Mm. And the dynamic. Like how dynamic it is. Right? I can, I how love, complex. I love myself and humans more than I've ever loved before by doing this work. And if if we're all about love and light, <laughs> if that's what we're about, if that's what we're about, we absolutely have to talk about what's uncomfortable. Well, it's the I only think, way to actual love and light. I think it's less about like you know, not not like the linguistics that we use about like, oh, the shadow work, the darkness, you know, and learning how to just become comfortable in the shadow and become comfortable in the darkness. So that hopefully we can remove the whole binary of shadow light, transformation. It's not good or bad. We, We can have this and that. Yes. You know, we can be here and be transforming at the same time. Okay, yes. Because isn't that evolution? You know, that's yeah. inevitably what we're going for. We've been talking for a long time. I think people are getting tired it. of us. I know. Okay, well, we're just going to turn us off and continue talking about <laughs> this. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, okay. But let's be done. Bye, guys. Peace. Or not, guys. Bye, you all. There we go. Linguistic <laughs> precision, people. <laughs>